another Leadership Conversation, hosted by the Center for Executive Succession at the Darla Moore School of Business. I'm your host, Anthony Nyberg, and today we are speaking with former U.S. Congressman Rob Andrews, who is currently the CEO of the Health Transformation Alliance, a coalition of the nation's largest businesses who are working to transform the way that companies provide employee health care. Rob, again, thank you very much for joining us and talking to our students again this year. We sincerely appreciate having you back on campus, or at least virtually back on campus. It's, it's a pleasure, Anthony. Um, I draw inspiration and knowledge from the men and women you teach. Uh, there's a freshness of thought here that's really attractive and engaging, so I'm happy to be here. So when we spoke a <laughs> few years ago, HTA was just finishing its first extremely successful year, as you were organizing. And it really seemed to offer hope for showing a path toward meaningfully changing the relationship between employees and their health providers. Can you remind us a little bit about really what the mission is of HTA and, and then really what's been going on the last few years? The mission of the HTA is to maximize the number of times the person sees the best provider and gets the greatest value out of that interaction. We're not here to get the cheapest x-ray uh, or the lowest cost statin. Uh, we're here to get the best result for the patient with a broken arm or with a cholesterol problem. We've had a lot of progress. Our members are incredibly dedicated to our mission. And in terms of quantitative growth, we've grown to 54 member companies uh, there's over 2 million people getting their pharmaceutical services through us today. Um, by the end of this year, there'll be about 500,000 people getting basic medical care through us uh, this year. And we build a data platform that has over 3 million people's experiences in it, protected by HIPAA, protected by privacy laws, that help us understand where the highest value providers are and how we can steer people in that direction. So. The numbers tell a story of growth. What we're more interested in is we see the effects of employers being able to uh, realize savings and steer people toward better care. So you, you talked about the, that the real goal is to get people the very best care that way. And, you, and 3 million people, that's, that's pretty amazing. So, but how does that save employers money or employees money or society money? Here's an example. Um, Sadly, about 30% of original cancer diagnoses are incorrect. Either the, the, the person's falsely identified as having cancer and they do not, or they have cancer and it's not identified, or more, uh, more frequently what happens is that the wrong cancer is identified. <laughs> so in that more frequent circumstance, a course of chemotherapy has begun it does significant harm to the healthy parts of the person's body. It does very little to retard the growth of the malignancy and the person gets sicker. Um, we're working with a group called the City of Hope Cancer Center in Southern California. And we have a, a virtual program where the patient's own doctor in their own community, their own oncologist can interact with experts world renowned about the particular form of cancer that person has. What that does, Anthony, is reduce the probability of an incorrect diagnosis. So instead of the chemotherapy happening a second time to get it right, it's, it's right the first time. What does that do? Well, most importantly, it increases the likelihood that the person is going to be healthy, is going to survive, go into remission and, and lead a good life. From an economic point of view though, you don't pay for the wrong chemotherapy the first time, pay to repair the damage that wrong chemotherapy produces, you pay for the right chemotherapy the first time. Person gets healthier. Again, most importantly, that person might live to walk their daughter down the aisle at her wedding, or might live to uh, go become the top salesman for the company or whatever he or she's gonna do in their life, but the employer spends less on the care. That's sort of example of what we're able to do. We want to do a lot more of it, but it's exciting that we can do it now. Can you say a little bit about 
what's been going on in terms of HTA and the current COVID crisis. It's a this is an unusual times to say the least. And does this does the COVID crisis give you any more insight into how we should be functioning as a society in terms of healthcare? Yeah, it certainly does, Anthony. Um, the main insight is not ours. We're observing it from our members and from other leaders. Uh, at a time when visiting a hospital or a doctor's office carries with it a set of risks that would not, we couldn't have imagined a year ago. Access to virtual care, the ability to see a physician virtually has skyrocketed importance. And so we're trying very hard to um, provide our members with tools and opportunities where they not only have access to virtual care, but they have access to great virtual care by physicians who are skilled and trained in providing that care. And that skill and training um, could be everything from how adept that they are looking at a photograph of a mole and determining whether it's melanoma, something technical, to something maybe even more important, which is cultural. Every, every patient brings a different set of beliefs and cultures to the interaction. And older people don't always think the way younger people do. And people from a European culture might not think the way people from a South American culture would. And the most precious resource in healthcare is the doctor-patient relationship. The most important part of that relationship is whether the person trusts the doctor. And so much of that trust, a lot of it is technical. You know, has the doctor seen this kind of problem before? Has the doctor had experience with solving that problem? But a big part of it is personal. Does this doctor understand me? Is she listening to me? Um, is he cognizant of what my life feels like? And so we're striving for virtual care that would match patients with the, the physician or the provider who is most skilled, both technically and culturally to help solve that patient's problem. You know, it, it's, I'm violating this rule right now, Anthony, but most successful endeavors happen when you do more listening than talking. And uh, we're trying to encourage that culture in a virtual setting. It it, does, it seems almost at odds to say you're going to help create a stronger patient healthcare provider relationship while also being virtual. So I, I think I can understand how that saves money, but how does that get to that, that stronger relationship that you just described also, the trust? In, in present times with COVID, a virtual relationship, which is not as good as one in person at first glance, replaces a missed relationship. The, one of the great crises of the COVID crisis is deferred care or neglected care. So the person whose knee swells up a lot, but really doesn't want to go to an emergency room or a doctor's office because of their exposure potentially to people who are uh, carriers. So a lot of care that needs to be happening isn't happening. Virtual is a safe space for the patient to get that care. Now, even in normal times, and I pray they happen sooner rather than later, there's a convenience factor. Um, the most successful products in our economy are ones that are portable, that operate on demand of the consumer, and the, but where the consumer receives great value. Uh, the cost they spend is, is dwarfed by the value they get. <clears throat> so think about movies. Uh, when I was growing up, you went to a movie theater, you stood in line, you bought a ticket, you hoped you got a seat, you watched the movie. Now our daughters use Netflix. Now what's the difference? Netflix is available when you want it, where you want it, and its customers believe that there's great value compared to the price they pay. The other obvious example is Amazon and JCPenney's. Um, I admire people in both companies and they both at different times in their history have been great companies, but let's look at the difference. With JC Penney's, you have to go to the store, more or less, although there are, there are some delivery, you more or less have to go to the store when they're open, if they have the goods, and you pay whatever price you pay, which reflects the overhead that Penny's incurs. 
Amazon is open 24 seven, has just about everything, delivers the product to you when you want it at a price is much lower. Now, healthcare is not selling sweaters or shoes, nor will it ever be, but it is not immune, pun intended, to this desire among consumers to have portable, high quality services on demand. So I, I would say that even when normal times occur, issues of convenience and access will continue the, the growth of virtual healthcare. It has its limits, but I think you'll see that growth uh, continue to accelerate. And as you say, it does raise some challenges that, that a physician who can hold your hand can comfort you more quickly than someone looking at you on Zoom. But if there's no physician at all because you can't get there or won't go there because of, of the pandemic, then you're not getting the care at all. And so have you seen then the, the as you said, the three million people, are they really responding positively to feeling like they're getting both better health care and at a cost savings or at more sometimes, convenient at least? Sometimes yes and sometimes no. That the technology is generally available to make it easy for people to engage a provider, a doctor or nurse online. The quality of that experience is varied. There are some rushed, commoditized, unsatisfactory experiences. There are some rich, enhanced, valuable experiences and everything in between. The, the fact that a lot of healthcare has moved to virtual interaction just changes the venue of the care. It doesn't change the underlying strengths and weaknesses of the care. R right now, um, where you go to see a doctor is almost like uh, a lottery. I mean, my knee hurts, what should I do? Well, my next door neighbor saw Dr. X, she's really good. My next door neighbor's an expert on orthopedics. You know, uh, so, so much of the decision making that's done now is by chance or by reputation. Sometimes it works really well, but sometimes it doesn't. And that whole problem, Anthony's being recreated in cyberspace. You dial up one of the, the uh, doc on demand services or various vendors. Sometimes you have a terrific experience, sometimes you don't. Sometimes the doctor is really well schooled in your data and understands your situation, sometimes she doesn't. What we're trying to do is use the data that we have at our disposal to ascertain where the high value experiences are and where they're not, and then help educate patients about that and steer them in the direction of the highest value care. That's really interesting because we, last time when we spoke, we you talked a little bit about the value of HR data and analytics and how it can really help all companies. But I think what you were just describing there is that one of HTA's real advantages is collecting all this data and then disseminating it also and, and analyzing that to what to help understand where the best services, best care. Very much so. Yeah, very much so. Now, I, I want to be clear. Best is not an easy term to define. It certainly doesn't mean cheapest. I don't think there's anyone watching us who would say, I want my daughter to have the cheapest mammogram. I don't think so. Best is value. It, it is a, a, a balance or an integration of who's really good at reading that radiology study. Who's really effective at the follow-up care. So we're trying to work with providers, with experts, to come up with data-driven, peer-driven, credible definitions of best. It is easier said than done. And I, I, I always look askance when you see no disrespect to them, but U.S. News and World Report saying, here's the top 100 hospitals in America. Well, based on what? Um, how pretty is their atrium? Is how good's the valet parking? Our net promoter score? Th those are relevant. But I think what we really want to know <coughs> is how do they do with, with treating patients? Um, do people get better or sicker? on a risk adjusted basis, meaning taking into account how old or sick or, or, or poor people are when they walk through the front door of the hospital, how does the hospital deal with that situation? So in everything else in our 
society. We are chock full of information about our consumer choices. So your phone plan, how many minutes do you get? How much memory do you get? How many phones do you get? What are your renewal rates? What sort of people know all about this. And there's intense competition for your business. But if your daughter needed a tonsillectomy, where's the information about all that? Now we're not gonna fill that gap immediately, but we are going to fill that gap with the information that we have and with the, the help of uh, our patients and doctors talking about the quality of their experience. And so that's really the, the mission that you started with in HDA. Have the challenges changed much over the last three years or are you, are you seeing new challenges that, that you're really having to face? The fundamental challenge has not changed, that we have a mismatch of incentives in the US health system, that providers generally get paid by how many procedures they do, not by how well they do them. This is not the fault of providers. This is a system that they are compelled to live under and so they practice that way. That will only change when demand changes the structure. When employers, and I would hope someday, public programs like Medicare and Medicaid begin to insist on outcomes, not just uh, numbers of procedures that are done. So that, that is changing, not fast enough in my judgment, but it's changing. What has changed uh, in, in our time is um, two things and they're related. One is an explosion of health tech companies that purport to inform patients and providers about the kinds of things we've been talking about this morning. Who's good at reading a radiology study? Who's effective at helping women through their pregnancy? And a lot of these companies are very good. Some of them are. A lot of them have data to back up their claims. Many of them don't. So sifting through that marketplace to identify the high value providers has become more challenging, but more important at the same time. And I think that the second big change is people have fallen in love with the technology in lieu of the outcome. So yeah, it's great that, you know, I have a mole on my arm this morning and I, I want it looked at and I probably within 15 minutes can have at least a primary care provider, if not a dermatologist, take a look at it as she would in her office and say, well, a mole that has changed in shape or size or color, and as far as forget the fourth one, is something you should worry about. And that doesn't look that way to me, so I think you're all right. That's, that's, that's great that you can now do that. But what's not been fixed, what the technology doesn't fix is, does the provider have the right data about you? Um, do they have the right training to draw the conclusion? And if you need a referral to a, to a specialist, who's the specialist they're gonna choose or direct you to? Is it based upon someone they went to medical school with? Is it based upon objective criteria. And again, I want to be clear. We are not faulting providers. I think the providers in this country are phenomenal people. They do a great job. They are living under the system that they inherited. But that system ironically devalues consumer information at the expense of reputation and subjectivity. Technology doesn't change that. It just changes the venue of it. So what we're hoping does not happen is that people fall in love with convenience but lose track of the ultimate objective, which is the highest value outcome for that patient. So you have about 3 million users in your group. That's a fairly small proportion of our society. And you did mention Medicaid and Medicare. So I'm just curious, as a society, can we get to this healthcare reform without it being government driven? I mean, can <coughs> groups like HTA really do it yeah. on their own or do we need government? And then the follow-up to that would be, will government ever get there? We need all institutions to push in this direction. Um, employers by themselves cannot do it. Government by itself cannot do it. My prediction to you is employers will get there first and government will follow. And, and I think the reason for this is that everything I just said 
about defining high value and lower value providers <clears throat> does imply that there will be uh, winners and losers, or at the very least, there'll be early winners and early losers who have to get better in order to get care because the standard of care is going to rise and not everyone will meet it. If Medicare instituted such, instituted such a system, it, they'd have a lot more clout because they have more data and spend a lot more money than employers do. But of course, ultimately Medicare is governed by voters and elected officials. So if in any given market in the country, Medicare published fair and objective criteria about the bottom 25% of orthopedics providers. I assure you that bottom 25% would form a trade association and they would lobby every elected official, Republican, Democrat on the Hill. And they would rally the troops of the employees. In most people's districts, the number one employer is a hospital. And so the employees, the voters would say to that congressman or senator, this new unfair Medicare regulation is gonna cost him my job. And I'm not at all indifferent, by the way, to that concern. I, I understand it, I share it, but it, it makes, it makes the uh, differentiation process between high value and low value providers much more difficult for people in the political realm. Employers are certainly deeply concerned with the thoughts and feelings of their employees. So they're not gonna, you know, they're not gonna treat people unfairly but they have more flexibility, they have more tools to move people in that direction. So my, my thought is employers will probably be in the vanguard of this effort and eventually the public programs will follow. The, re the main reason I, I, I'm optimistic about this <coughs> is people under say 35 have always essentially done everything on demand at their own convenience in a venue they're comfortable with for high value. Again, Amazon versus JC Penney's, Netflix versus Blockbuster Video. And that generation has grown up expecting that's the way goods and services are delivered. As, the gener as that generation grows and becomes a larger part of the healthcare spend, I think suppliers uh, and providers will either respond to that or perish. So I, I think there's a demographic tidal wave here that's headed in the direction that we're talking about. Uh, as a former congressman, clearly, again, you are a great person to kind of talk about, or give your opinion on what's going on with the social, the angst about social injustice right now and um, on all sides. And can you say a little bit about what you think maybe the role of, that companies have to play in making our society more just, equitable? All institutions have to practice what they preach. And this is particularly true of companies. Um, I'm reminded of the day when a company would buy minority kids in a, in a low income area free laptops through their foundation, which is a great thing to do. But it's kind of symbolic. Companies, if they recognize, and I certainly think they should and do, that there is systemic racism throughout our system, that that problem doesn't stop at the front door of the plant or the office or the store, that it pervades the way a lot of people think in American culture. Um, putting aside the considerable moral suasion of treating every person equally without regard to race, creed, sexual orientation, religion, putting aside the, what I view as a elemental commitment to those principles, it's really bad for business not to be inclusive and respectful of differences. Um, the state of California today, whites are a plurality of the state and racial minorities are a majority when you combine them. By the middle of this century, that will be true of the United States. It is already true of most companies in the United States, at least many companies in the United States, that international business is important to their future. They either sell a product overseas or they buy material from overseas. Um, 
obviously the rest of the world is much different than the demographic makeup of the United States. So a business that opts to be exclusive, that opts to not encourage, not incorporate in its thinking other points of view and diverse understandings of problems, is at a commercial disadvantage. Putting aside, again, any moral views one has on this, a commercial disadvantage. And so I think, I'm actually proud of American business in what we've seen the last couple of months, um, both in the pandemic and the social unrest. Uh, Boeing, just this week, stepped forward and made a very specific commitment about increasing the diversity of its workforce. Uh, bold commitment that will be difficult to meet, but it's real and it's measurable and it's, it's walking the walk. The first major institution in the United States to, I think, fully grasp and understand the breadth of the pandemic was the National Basketball Association. I remember still being pretty thick-headed about this in, in February or March, whatever it was by that time, and looking at a message come across my phone that the NBA was suspending its season being stunned in the light of what else was still going on. So I think that because they are not burdened by some of the banalities of our politics and prejudices of our politics, that men and women who are le leaders in business have both the opportunity and the imperative to act sooner and better. Not all of them have. I'm not claiming that, but I think there has been real leadership that's come out of corporate America in this crisis. I hope to see more of it. I hope to see other institutions like government and education uh, and other institutions step forward as well. But the idea that the, uh, the strife that we have in this country stops at the front door of your business is a fallacy. It's a fallacy. So it really seems like in the two, at least two of the bigger challenges we have right now, both in one, what you just described, equity for all, and the other, health, that you're, you're thinking organizations are really going to have to take the lead on this. And the hopeful message you have is that it seems like they're actually doing that. Many are. Many are. And, and again, I don't mean this to be a negative comment. I mean to be a positive one. Bigotry has always been an infectious, debilitating disease on a moral basis. Anyone who's ever felt the burden of discrimination uh, could talk chapter and verse with great passion about what's wrong with that. The perception I believe that's changing, Anthony, is that bigotry is a really bad business strategy. And not just bigotry, which is frankly overt, intentional disrespect for people, but obliviousness, indifference, is almost an equally bad business strategy. Because the depositors in your bank, the, cu the customers who might borrow from you, the people who might work for you, the funds that might invest in you, are increasingly taking a view that if, you're, if your bank or your business or your institution is oblivious to these concerns, they don't want to do business with you. Now, I'm not suggesting that, matter of fact, I'm suggesting the opposite. I'm not suggesting that um, businesses should become partisan. I think that would be a dreadful mistake. I'm suggesting they become aware of their circumstances. And I think that in the last few months, many corporations in this country have shown that awareness. They have acted in ways that walk the walk that hold them accountable. It's very easy to say, here at ABC Co, we believe in equal treatment and, and dignity for every person, irrespective of their race or background. It's a lot more difficult to say, we've looked at our workforce, it's not diverse enough, we're gonna change that. And by year X, we're gonna have a, a workforce that looks a lot different. And I do say, again, that Boeing this very week has said that. And I, I look at others and find them to be a source of encouragement. Um, <clears throat> look, the other thing that can happen if you avoid partisanship is that 
workplaces can become places for honest conversations about race. Where it's not, well, you said this because you're red or she said that because she's blue, but it can be, how can we do a better job selling our product in the Indian American community? How can we do a better job of recruiting people who speak fluent Spanish to deal with our customers? How can we do a better job of, of understanding our customers better and have more women in our C-suite and on our board? You understand the way you frame these questions is not about politics, it's about the growth of the enterprise. And I think smart business leaders are framing and answering those questions every day. Thank you again for uh, at least giving me some hope at the end of this. And as always, for joining us. We sincerely appreciate having you here. It's a pleasure, Anthony. I'd love to do it again. You just listened to another Leadership Conversation. Today, Rob Andrews, CEO of the Health Transformation Alliance, shared his views regarding how organizations can transform the healthcare industry through the billions of dollars that are spent on healthcare through HTA's members and through using technology to identify the most efficient and effective healthcare options. As he always does, he left us with a great deal to think about, both in terms of healthcare and in terms of equitable treatment for all. His message is both insightful and inspiring, a reminder that is up to us and the organizations that we work in to make a difference. On behalf of all of us who are associated with the Master of Human Resources program and the Center for Executive Succession here at the University of South Carolina, thank you for joining us.